The neighborhood in Hopewell Junction, where my father put his family when he started working for IBM in the area, was built from the ground up by himself and a bunch of other families, developed out of a large farm owned by a family that had been there for many generations. So it was a suburb, but it was a very new one. Looking back now, as I remember the many, many times that I walked around this neighborhood, I'm struck by the fact that there were plenty of suburban homes, A-frames and ranch houses, and there was one house, pretty straightforward, that had a horse. It had an actual horse and a corral and fences, so you literally had a suburban home, a suburban home, a home with a horse, and then another suburban home. And since I was born in it, it was only many years later that I realized that was weird. That was unusual. That was something that, for others, it would be very hard to explain that we didn't think anything of it. I was very young, so I don't recall any meetings or discussions about the horse. There was just a horse. I'm thinking of a few other cases where, looking back now, maybe things were a little weirder than I recall them at the time. There might be some amusement in that. So let's revisit a few of them. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. When I worked at MIT, there was a place called the MIT Discard Warehouse, where all of the equipment, whether it was furniture, computer parts, or electronic equipment, would end up there. Since the school didn't necessarily want to recycle everything, there was a very weird tension about the fact that a large amount of equipment was passing through the place and would become outdated. And one of the ways that they dealt with this was to have a place, a room, actually multiple rooms, with a person there who would take in this equipment, hold it, and you could go in and he would be rather cavalier about how much equipment would cost you. You might walk away with a Sun workstation for $50 or a shelf unit for 20 It was all a matter of just providing some sort of exit strategy for equipment the school otherwise would have to pay to dispose of. And while I've talked about that before, it's interesting to me about these centers of equipment and discard and finding one more round, one more chance to play a part. There was an entire room of computer history that was lost due to a whole set of circumstances I don't really want to go into. But what happened was that hundreds of pallets of computer equipment, software, and hardware, and related materials ended up in a recycler. Now, when you think recycler, I think we immediately think of destruction, some sort of large burning fire or a slurry, a a vat that things are being lost into. But that's not how most of them work. Many of them take in equipment or take in office pieces and then find ways to sell them by the pound or by the piece to other vendors that they have relationships with. And due to me catching people at just the right time, I had an opportunity to go to this collection, this very large collection, before it was dissipated to the many winds. I went to Sacramento, California, driving and getting a hotel nearby so that I could wake up and be there as early as possible. They let me in, and I walked among the pallets, seeing all sorts of equipment, all sorts of history, packaged together, loosely bound in cellophane and wrap, 
and finding that they were slowly undoing these pallets, cleaning up the equipment, putting it on a shelf, and then prepping it for eBay and auction. And they were going to do that for at least a year or two. These sort of places exist everywhere. And walking among it, I felt like some of it had some sort of a home where they would be treated with the respect that they deserve. At some point, you start to realize how much commercial equipment flows through the world. We get very hung up when we encounter something that has a childhood or distant memory, something that passed either through our hands or aspirationally wished that it would pass through our hands, and then seeing it's not going to have a happy ending. Without understanding that when things are manufactured in the tens or even hundreds of thousands, the destiny of much of that equipment is always going to be dark. That's the nature of things. We take pride in what we have and what we have the opportunity to keep for ourselves. But there's a constantly moving stream, a conveyor of all this sort of equipment, going back, frankly, hundreds of years, that in some cases finds a destination that will keep it for a few decades longer and other times represents the end of the road. Now, that visit to that warehouse, that recycler, is particularly entertaining to me because the people who let me in didn't tell the owner. So at one point during the process, after I'd taken a whole bunch of pictures and tried to capture the zeitgeist of what was passing through, the owner contacted them and screamed to get Jason Scott out of the building. So I was ejected politely, sent on my way. I didn't take any of it personally. In Pennsylvania, working on pre-production for what eventually became the eventually canceled arcade documentary, I visited a pinball palace, a warehouse full of pinball machines run by a fellow who was very skeptical that I would provide something positive for him by filming there. I believe very strongly in not taking advantage of people, of not forcing them into a place that they shouldn't be by convincing them that in some way time is running out, uh, opportunity is going to disappear. Talking with this person, I felt that he had some bad memories of documentaries that had filmed his collection before, and 20-plus years on, he still resented it. So uh, I quickly realized that I was going to leave my film equipment in the car and just walk around. Pinball machines come apart. The back glass and that whole box disconnects from the main table, so you're able to stack them transport them easily, take the legs off, put those boxes inside of wrapping, and either transport them by freight or in the back of a truck, and then reassemble them. The reason I mention this is because parts of this warehouse had those back glasses stacked up to the ceiling, 10, 15, 20 at a time, along with piles of the tables next to them. At the time, it almost seemed normal, but I also started thinking of crane shots and drone shots to show this unbelievable situation of a multi-story, multi-level collection of ancient pinball machines. And while we were talking, he let me know he didn't think his collection was very big. He claimed to me that there was a warehouse in Florida owned by a family who had been in the distribution business, and that inside of a warehouse the size of a city block on all sides were hundreds, maybe thousands, of pinball machines stacked up just like he was doing, and that that collection had been lying for decades, untouched, because they didn't know what to do next, but loss aversion prevented them from ever giving it away. You tend to be skeptical that that story is true, but then you hear about the 
absolutely true story that Rye Playland had a snack bar and the snack bar was up against a wall and while doing some renovations they took the wall down and found an entire 1980s arcade that they had just walled up when they had decided they didn't want to deal with it leaving piles of vintage machines vintage carpets vintage change machines just back there while they had hot dogs serving in front of this false wall. They opened it like a long-forgotten Egyptian tomb of treasures immeasurable in the way that the machines were utterly untouched for many, many years. So I can't dispute that this doesn't happen. Mythology of forgotten caches, of treasures untold, resonate everywhere in vintage computing. One of the holy grails for me was CompuServe material, and I had thought maybe there were places that CompuServe material could be, and recently the Computer History Museum acquired some. But while I was making arrangements for the pickup of computer shoppers in Columbus, Ohio, another resident of that city contacted me and asked me if I wanted a whole bunch of CompuServe manuals. It turned out he had also worked for CompuServe, and he wanted to know if I wanted it as well. One of the results of all these situations is that I don't feel that things are over, that we had an era with interesting items and stories to be told, and they're gone, lost, forgotten. There's an entire network, commercial, personal, underground, that has been collecting things for a very long time. And every once in a while, apropos of nothing, I become aware that somebody has boxes and boxes of collected materials from a family member, from their own history, from someone they never met but simply acquired the estate of. And in those moments, those bright, beautiful moments, I find out that there's a little more interesting stuff still to be discovered in the world. These situations that happen in between parts of life and end up with this fun story at the end are situations that I'm ready for, that I've been working diligently to set up my office and a whole network and a whole set of people who are ready to receive them to turn them digital, to catalog them, to understand them, and then provide them to people. The arbitrariness of how all of this works can seem frightening, really. The fact that there are so many places that only need one person to step forward and take responsibility, but only one person may be too much to ask for. But I believe strongly that Destiny does play a part in all of this, that something that is collected and cared for cries out for people to take one more shot, one more classified ad, one more virtual listing of something that may be available. My inbox is often filled with people who notice that somebody put up a few pictures of something they found, and they ask me, do you want it? Literal dozens of tons of material has come to me that way. And the fact that that is such a major part of my life, a story that plays over and over, and how I got into this situation is about as odd and unexplainable as a suburban neighborhood with a horse. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, Martin, Sembiance, Tiggs, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There's something very exciting about the moment you hear about a collection. It's very similar to a wedding or a party where the excitement that it's going to happen is palpable and powerful. 
But then <laughs> comes the logistics, the organizing of shipping costs and trucks and paper and plastic to transport them in. The ideas of what will come next. What will you do with these old items? Where will they find homes? Are they things you can work with? How hard are they to digitize? How hard are they to present in other medium? It's that initial rush of joy that has to feed you through months and maybe years of processing. That's the underbelly of what I do. And while I'm sure there's items that unfortunately, may never get processed by me in my lifetime. The fact that in a relay race that extends infinitely, I was able to play a part in transferring it to the next generation will have to be, and it often is, just enough. <laughs>